graduates, will you please stand for me? I want them to be seen. They have worked long and hard for this and they've earned every minute of it. So I want them to stand for just a second and be recognized. to our 2022 ISAP GED graduation ceremony. My name is Ann Nave and I'm the supervisor of the high school GED program. On behalf of the high school GED staff and everyone here this evening, I welcome you all. Graduates, we are honored to be here to honor you this evening. This is a milestone in your life. This marks the completion of your high school credential. If I can ask everyone to please stand for the Star Spangled Banner. everyone taking time to be here. There's so many competing events this time of year, so we're grateful that you chose to be with us this evening. A very special thank you to Mr. Townsend, our sound guy tonight, principal of Jamestown High School. Thank you for the use of your facility. Thanks to the other Jamestown staff who helped get us set up this evening and take care of us. We appreciate that as well. Finally, I would like to recognize the Jamestown and Lafayette Honors Orchestra with us again this year. You can't see them, but you hear them. They're under the direction of Ms. Mary Clark. Please join me in thanking them for sharing their talent. 
honored with us this evening. We are so honored that they choose to play for us every year. And finally, I have to acknowledge and thank publicly our transportation department. They work with us daily, multiple times a day, um, for all of our transportation needs to get these students here on this stage. Without them, we may not be here. So thanks to all of our transportation, bus drivers, routers, everybody in the transportation department, we could not be here without them. I will invite Dr. Heron and Mr. Dowell, following her, to come give some congratu congratulatory remarks. Thank you, Dr. Now. Um, good evening, GED graduates, families, and honored guests. Thank you for being here this evening for this really important event. Tonight we are here to celebrate the accomplishments of hardworking and successful young men and women who have earned their GED. Earning this diploma is quite an achievement. It takes commitment, tenacity, and focus on the future and what you want to achieve. Students, your accomplishment reminds me of a saying, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You have taken first important step on life's journey by earning your GED this evening. I know your journey will continue with other important steps along the way, for example, your first job or your first college course. Each of these will be milestones along the way that you and your family who are here tonight with you will be able to see and to celebrate. By earning this diploma, we know you have opened the doors to better and more career opportunities or continuing your education. We are very proud of your accomplishments this evening and know that by graduating, you have prepared yourself well for the journey ahead and you've taken your next steps towards a bright future. Congratulations and we wish you every success. Now Mr. Dial, Chair of the School Board, will say a few words. This is one of my most favorite events of the year, my first one to, to be with you publicly and in person. And I just want to say, it's just, I'm just incredibly proud of you, honored to be here, uh, celebrating your steadfastness, your determination, your courage to finish. And I know that your family and friends are very proud too. Um, I know that it's not easy to meet all the requirements for a diploma, and that students sometimes face seemingly overwhelming obstacles that stand in the way of reaching this goal. We celebrate your graduation because it is a celebration of life-changing feats, earning a high school diploma. What's great about tonight's ceremony is that everyone who is receiving a diploma tonight has faced an obstacle, perhaps four. But you didn't let that stop you. No, you made the decision to prevail and to triumph. You made the decision to graduate. The resiliency you've shown and learn firsthand that this process will serve you well as you meet and surmount other challenges in your life. That grit, that determination you have shown have already transformed who you are. Every one of you is now a successful graduate, and one that you will be, who is ready to take on the next challenge, and there will be other challenges, whatever that might be. Just remember this moment, how you rose to the occasion, you met the challenge head on, and you can change take on any other challenge that life brings to you. Congratulations, you have my utmost respect, and I believe that of your family and friends, and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Congratulations. Thank you both for your kind remarks. Before we hear from our student speaker, I want to recognize our high school staff, Ms. Stedman and Mr. Swenson. I cannot convey to you how committed these two teachers are to our students and the entire GED program. These two go above and beyond to get these students on this stage. They are in constant communication with each student so they can stay on top of what the needs are. They come up with creative ways to teach. 
each individual student each day what he or she needs. They collaborate with each other on a daily basis. There is no whole group instruction in this program. There is no stand and deliver instruction. There are separate individualized lesson plans every day for these students. And that's before we get to the chauffeuring part to get the students to Newport News or to Richmond to the testing sites if they need a ride. So thank you, Ms. Stedman and Mr. Swenson, for all you've done for these graduates. And now, Ms. Stedman will introduce our student speaker. Friends, 
relatives, uh, mom, dad, sister, brother. And um, you can't hear me very well, can you? And I have a soft voice, so I'm looking at my wife right now, and she's doing this, which means I need to speak up. Uh, so thank you. Uh, if you can't hear me, and if you want to do this, please do so. I don't feel offended in the least. Um, when they say I can identify with these students, these GED students or graduates, I should say now, let me tell you how I can identify. I never finished the ninth grade. I uh, came from a broken family. My father left my mother and my two other siblings when I was 10. I didn't see him again until I was 15. My mother, uh, she was on welfare for a little while and then she started working at the foundries uh, for General Motors in Saginaw, Michigan. So I'm not originally from here in Virginia, but I've lived in Virginia for the last almost 30 years now. So I was, uh, I went hungry a lot. Uh, if you looked at some of my pictures when I was really young, you could see how skinny I was uh, because there were days where I went without food, two to three days. The longest stretch that I went was 10 days. So when I got in the Navy and I started having three course meals every day, that was different. I wasn't used to that at all. Um, but I was being accused a lot of, from the frustrations that my mother went through because my father left, left her, and again, not seeing or not growing into a normal family, uh, which I would observe from the rest of my friends. You know, that was a really tough thing to do, and the only thing I was really good at was sports. Uh, I wasn't good at education at all. I had trouble reading. Uh, and so I thought the best thing for me to do was you know, I'm 16 years old, I'm going to try and join the Navy. And so I went to see a recruiter. They said, well, Bruce, you're not old enough to get in yet, but, um, but we will take you when you turn 17. And so I waited until I was 17. A couple weeks after I turned 17, I was in the Navy. So the first, uh, the first thing I, I was at was Great Lakes, Illinois, boot camp. And, um, I found out I was the youngest person in boot camp. And then after I graduated from boot camp, I went to um, my first Navy school and I failed because I couldn't understand anything that I was reading. And so the very first place I went to was the ship. USS Monroe was a sports class destroyer. And that was kind of like a blessing in disguise. So when I'm in the Navy, um, the Navy decided that they were going to send me to this remedial school for six weeks because I'm, I don't have a high school diploma. And so during that, that six weeks, they found out I was functionally illiterate. I had a third grade reading level. So, and again, I was having a tough time reading. I had such a hard time reading when I was growing up that even a comic strip was sometimes too much for me. So I just said, forget it. I didn't, I didn't need that. But there was one thing that I had. I had this desire. I wanted to learn. Somehow, I wanted to learn. And in the process of my time in that early stage, uh, the captain of the ship would come up to me every once in a while. And I never really understood why, at the time anyway, why he would spend some time with me, just getting to know me, try to encourage me. And years later, I kind of figured it out that because I was the youngest person on the ship, I was his weakest link. Now, the Navy saying is, the ship is only as strong as the weakest link. And so I must have been his weakest link. And it makes sense to me now. But back then, I wasn't really sure why he would do that. But in the process of me being on that ship for two and a half years, I met a civilian by the name of Rick Gregory. He, I met him at a Bible study of all places, and he began to take me under his wing. Uh, and then through the process of getting to know one another, he would invite me to his house if I didn't have duty on the weekends. And he would begin to teach me to learn how to read. And that was the very beginning of my academic success. And then when I was at uh, on board ship, going back to the ship, we were stationed at 32nd Street, San Diego. 
So it's a huge Navy base. It's the second largest in the United States, only second to Norfolk. And um, I started taking these high school courses that they offered on the base uh, to people that had the time to go. And so here I didn't even finish ninth grade. And I'm taking these courses. And then, and then eventually, you know, our ship goes on a Westpac, which is we're traveling throughout the Far East. And when we pulled into the Philippines, they offered people who wanted to that don't have a uh, GED, if they wanted to take the test, they would allow you to do so. And so three of us signed up to take it. I was one of the three. And then three, four weeks after the fact, um, I was standing at quarters, which means that I'm at attention, and the officer on duty was uh, reading the plan of the day. And then he went over uh, the two people who passed their GED. And the moment he said my name, I was screaming. I was jumping up and down, and I was twirling in the air, I was screaming, I was so happy. And then I finally realized where I was at. So momentarily I lost every play, everything that I was thinking inside, I lost everything. And I jumped back to attention and said, sorry, sir. <laughs> and everybody, including the officer of the deck, started laughing his head off. But I could tell at that point there, it was important. It was real. And so I would, watch these people, these officers in particular, that would come from the Naval Academy. And I thought to myself, why can't I have what they have? I want what they have. And so eventually I uh, left the, the ship and I went to corpsman school where I became a hospital corpsman. But in that period of time, I was still struggling to learn how to study to read, to understand what I was reading. But I was getting up really early in the morning. I was probably studying harder than any other person within, the, within that program itself. And then they came up to me and said, Bruce, you, you failed a couple of these tests. We can't advance you unless you pass these tests. So we're gonna set you back for three weeks. And if you fail another test, we're gonna have to let you go. You're gonna have to go back to the fleet. So, Again, there's pressure on me. But those three weeks were probably the best deal that I had because I had the chance to re-go over the information and I finally succeeded and I passed Corman School. Now, when I went through the graduation ceremony, that was the very first ceremony that I experienced. That was the first of five altogether. And the one thing that I remember about the ceremony was the commencement speaker, who was the captain of the Naval Hospital. And this is what he said, and I never forgot it. It just, it burns in me even today. He said, the most dangerous person in medicine is those who know just a little. Never forgot that. Those who, the most dangerous people in medicine are those that know just a little. Little. It took me a long time to dwell on that, to think about that, and I thought about that over the years because I, I started thinking, okay, I understand how that could be a danger to people in medicine. Because if you don't know that much and then you start practicing medicine in an area that you're not supposed to be practicing in, you could literally hurt somebody. That made perfect sense. And then I started thinking, well, those who know a little bit about leadership can hurt a lot of people. Those who know a little bit about management can hurt a lot of people. Those who know a little bit about banking can hurt a lot of people. This goes on and on and on. That's what I remember the most about it, um, education, or at least my education at Corman School. It is that state of fear. Now, Rene Descartes, who was a philosopher and mathematician, said this, for several years now, I have been aware that I accept many falsehoods as true in my youth. That, I, that what I build on the foundations of those falsehoods 
was dubious. And accordingly, that once in my life, I need to tear down everything and begin anew from the foundation if I want to establish any stable and lasting knowledge. It's a pretty wise statement. Right? This is the same person that said, I think, therefore I am. Now I had a lot of things that I had to change about my own public, my own public perception, my own way of thinking. How do people accept me? How do I fit in? Whatever. I think, therefore I am. Socrates once said, uh, at least we believe it was from Socrates, he said, know thyself. I had a lot to learn because after I finished my career in the Navy, I only had 33 college credit hours, including those that I had within my uh, performance school, because most of that was medical science, or almost all of it was medical science. And I did a couple of courses at uh, University of uh, Maryland and University of Wisconsin, not very ma many courses at all, but uh, after I got out of the Navy, it took me nine years total for my GED to get my undergraduate degree. Nine years. Nine years of trying to figure out how this brain works. Why is, why is my thinking process differently than some of the average students there? And it wasn't until my undergraduate senior year that I found out that I had dyslexia. And that made perfect sense to me. That, that changed everything for me because I finally realized why I was slow, why I couldn't understand what I was reading for all those years. And even though I'm still slow at reading, reading is my favorite thing to do now. I don't despise it, I don't hate it, I love it. So every morning I get up with a cup of coffee and I read for at least two hours every morning. It's the best thing, it's my favorite thing in the morning. My wife has been so gracious to me because she allows me to do that. So in other words then, this weakness that was in me became a strength instead of a weakness. And see, this is what life can do. It, it can change you, it can help you, it can redirect you. So when I hear that, okay, if you did the GED program, you didn't really go the right road, you went a different road, but who's to say which is the right road or which is the wrong road? It's the right road for you, as well as the right road for me because it helped me to become a person that really wanted an education. Now that doesn't mean anything less than somebody that graduates from high school, the, right, the, the, the route where they go through all 12 grades. But it means something special to me when I see GED students because it's the right road for you. The people that I would have gone to high school with, they were you know, playing sports, involved in their classmates, went through their high school graduation. What was I doing? I was seeing the world. I was on a Navy ship that went through the Orient, and I got to see a lot of places, and I got to learn a lot of things. It's kind of like what we would call the school of art models. So I think in that road, that was the right road for me. And in the process, I got to meet my wife, who was also in the Navy. And we have, we're going on 42 years of marriage now. That was the right road. That was the right road for me. So my question to you is, what do you want to do now? Is the road you have chosen the right road for you, which I believe it is? And what do you hope for as you move forward? You know, when I was in the service, not knowing that I could ever go to college, because I truly believed that I was in college material. Truly believed that. But then I was putting away money every single month in a college program, college savings program, hoping, just hoping, that I would have that chance. Now, there's a difference between strategic leadership, I mean, strategic planning and and future aid. And the difference is this. In strategic planning, usually businesses look at what they want to do in the next five, ten years. And in futuring, that goes 15 years and beyond. So 
Let me get you to start thinking in this light, just momentarily. Now, in futurists, um, and that's a real profession too, being a futurist, they ask four questions. Where have we come from? Where are we now? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? Four things. Now, let me put this in a practical application for you because the U.S. military has been doing this practice for decades. To give you an example, um, the Battle of Jutland, uh, which uh, took place 105 years ago yesterday, as a matter of fact. May 31st, 1916, where the British Navy engaged the German Navy during, the, uh, during World War I. And in the North Atlantic, just uh, outside of Denmark, these two navies engaged each other. And the Royal Navy, they had 151 ships to the Germans on uh, 99. Now, in the course of the battle, which only lasted 12 hours, the, the, the British Navy lost 6,094 sailors and officers. It's the worst disaster the Navy ever faced, their Navy ever faced, in the history of the British Navy, in 12 hours. They lost 14 ships altogether. The German Navy lost uh, 11 ships, just 11. And their crew manifest they lost 2,551 uh, sailors. So it looked like more of a German victory than a British victory, but they never engaged each other again. There was a lot of mistakes that were made by the British Navy. For instance, they had 17 compartments Know, uh, watertight compartments, and yet almost all of them were left open. Now, the Titanic sunk based on they didn't have watertight compartments. And so the British Navy, they left those doors open because they were trying to transfer ammunition to the guns from one section to another. And so when these casings exploded, for instance, the Queen Mary, they took seven hits and exploded during this battle. The same type of ship that engaged from the German side, uh, which was called um, Seditz, um, the Seditzlitz, I'm pronouncing it wrong because it's a German name. They took 24 hits, same compartmental size, 18 watertight patches, 24 hits, and yet they were able to live into port after those 24 hits. Yeah. The difference is this, is the British had new technology, but their battle tactics were too far behind. They didn't learn. And so the Navy War College in the United States, they used that, they used that scenario and thought to themselves that, okay, these dreadnoughts are going to be the future of Navy warfare. But some of the people in the War College didn't accept that, they didn't believe that because a run issue was flying, flying over that, uh, uh, the future of aircraft getting into the wars. And so um, Chester Nimitz, when he was a student at the War College in 1922, he thought his, his dissertation was on uh, the Battle of the Jutland, but he said, man, these people, some of these people that believe this, that this is the future of naval warfare, I don't think I agree with that, is what he was saying. He believed that the Navy needed to be prepared for whatever happens in their future. So 1922, 1922 is 18 years from, 18, 19 years from America engaging in the war. So when Nimitz, when he was a commander in the Navy, he would look at um, the future of the Navy and he thought to himself, okay, we're gonna future this thing out, and we're gonna think, okay, if we're gonna face anybody in the Pacific, it's gonna be the Japanese Imperial Navy. And so they would create all of these scenarios on what they thought would work, what they needed to expect. How were they gonna deal with a situation if they uh, attack Pearl Harbor, if they attack Guadalcanal? They created all these scenarios, and by the end of his career, Admiral, when he was an admiral now, he said that, that Naval War College prepared him for everything that he needed to know brought during the war and then even after, during peacetime. He was well prepared. He was, he was looking in the eyes of the future. So what I'm asking you 
in this whole process is, what do you want to do and where do you want to be 20 years from now? Don't think that's a long time because when I first joined the Navy, they said, Bruce, because I went into late entry in 19, December 1977, I was in the next month. And they said, Bruce, you can retire in 1997. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is so long from now. It's been a long, it's been a lot longer since then. So, so it's not that far away. So if you can think in the future, where do you want to be? What do you want to do 15 years from now? Dwight Eisenhower said this when he was a general in Europe, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So, let me, re let me remind you of this. The most dangerous person in any profession is one who knows a little. Know as much as you can get. You have your whole life in. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Mistakes that you make are sometimes the best teaching tools you'll ever find. And I have to tell my students that as well because they're so afraid of making a mistake. And yet, they're so consumed about the, G, the uh, GPA that they forget the joy of learning sometimes. Become a lifelong learner and see where your life takes you because you have a whole future ahead of you. And it can be exciting for you, uh, because it certainly was for me. And although I'm in my early 60s now, I still got a lot of life ahead of me. And uh, I'm looking forward to the future. And I hope you are too. Thank you so much. And so much. sharing your story with us. So graduates, this is what you all came for, your certificates. I will ask Mr. Dowell and Dr. Heron to come forward to award the certificates this evening. Ms. Stedman and Mr. Swinson will assist. This evening is Serenity Brooks.
Kevin McKinney. Raiden Melch. Some of you have gone in circles, some of you have zigzagged, some of you have made trapezoids. I don't know. You've been in many different directions. But it doesn't matter. You did what it took to get here, and that's the important part. That grit and that resilience is perfect. That will take you far in life. Continue to do that. Go out into this world after today and continue to make things happen for yourself. Your education has not come to an end with this graduation ceremony. All right, graduates, I'm gonna ask you to stand. You have one final task to do before you can be completely done. If you will move your tassel from the right side to the left. Henry, if you will lead your fellow graduates out of the auditorium. 